here at the United Nations uh, have great hopes for this project. Active engagement, like we see here tonight, of all members of society is one of the keys to successful po poverty eradication strategies. It can help poverty, keep poverty high on the global public's awareness and at the top of the international agenda. And despite the precarious state of the world economy, we have made major advances and we can continue to do so. We have the resources, we have the know-how, there are inspiring examples of progress across the world showing how to address multiple dimensions of poverty. I thank the organizers for this event for inspiring people and for us all to reflect, participate and act. In my own work as a journalist over the last 25 years, most of my life has been spent in zones of conflict, reporting on genocide, on civil war. And the one thing that has really struck me time and again is that in all of those situations, poverty was almost always a cause of the bloodshed that I was seeing. And if it wasn't a cause, it was almost certainly a consequence. Now, what we're going to do tonight is launch a global event, and you've heard. These films will reach an audience across the world of half a billion people. That's quite extraordinary in this day and age. Too often it's easy to look at television and assume it's an endless round of the Kardashians. <laughs> you know, a celebrity service. But what you're going to see tonight and what's going to be broadcast across the world is something that reflects, to quote Mr. Lincoln, the better angels of the television nature. It's about questioning, it's about intelligence. Here to tell you more about this epic project are two people who've really been the driving forces behind it, and that's Meta Hoffman, Mayor of Danish Television, and Nick Fraser of the BBC. So think about it, I mean, 500 million people, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a billion eyeballs, I guess. Today, <laughs> keeping the statistics, <laughs> today we are here to celebrate eight films that we believe can touch people through their honesty and exploration but we will explore the issues of poverty, what creates opportunities in life and what hinders people living a decent and dignified life. And to hopefully set in motion a global debate that will shape the way we think about poverty today. And I hope you all will take, care, will take part in this debate and just create a better world. I'm proudest of our filmmakers. I have a kind of awe at what they've accomplished. As I watch these films again and again and again, I'm startled, and I think you will be. I think what startles me first are the voices in the films. Among the films, you can see what it feels like to be a second wife of a Bedouin. You can know also, um, in another remarkable film, what it's like to be trapped at the bottom of the educational pile in China. You want to be educated because you're told that's what you have to do, and when you do get educated, you find there's nothing there. And in another film, you can, for an hour, think of yourself running through history, wondering what it's like not to be rich from the Stone Age to the present. Do we really know what it's like to be poor? I wonder about that. Our films tell you that you have to know how to look. You have to want to look, and we have to help you to look. Second, I think, our films tell you about the different ways in which it may be possible to do something globally or on a more intimate scale about poverty. Good evening. Why poverty? In a world in constant development, why does poverty persist? Every one of the eight powerful documentaries will affect you. As mentioned by previous speakers, this means taking advantage of the media's unique ability to focus on important issues. Here, questions can be posed in narrative and a personal way, which enables the viewer to better understand and identify with the issue at hand. The issue of preventing maternal deaths in childbirth and promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights of women is a subject that is close to my heart. I hope for a day when maternal health is equally distributed and women no longer risk life by giving life. A day where every pregnancy is wished for and every birth is safe, no matter who you are 
or where you live. It is my great wish that we can all work together to achieve the future we want. Tonight, we can start a global conversation by asking the question, why? something we want to show to the world, to the developing world, that it can be done. Maybe one of my children will become somebody great. I've never heard it expressed so beautifully. And I think it's the best repost, certainly I've ever heard, to the loudmouths in the Western world who go around saying, why do these people have so many children? Now, it is time to introduce you to our wonderful panel. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm first going to ask to join us here, Danny Glover, actor, director and political activist. Next, ladies and gentlemen, Anina Mohammed. Last June, she was appointed as the Secretary General's Special Advisor on post-2015 development planning. Because if you look up, you will see Christina Friesbach. Let me assure you that Denmark's Minister for Development has not had a sex change. <laughs> Christian Friespa. Zambia, a country I know and love well, is Robert Sachenga, the country's Minister of Commerce, Trade and Industry. And that's a key job in the development of his nation. He's a business, a businessman and he's also the founding chair of Transparency. In um, these eight documentaries are going to set a standard, I think, in terms of storytelling. And as I like to say that when we open people's heart, we often open their minds. من السر البنت صف خامس او سادس خلاص روحوها من المدرسه عيب. هسه مثل البنات هذول مو حرام شبابهن يضيع بدون عمل. رضاكم غير رضاكم ودي اعمل. ودي انتج. To see this book, this is only a woman's job. A man cannot do it. A woman has patience and time, and she will listen and learn. If you train a man, he wants to leave the village and go somewhere else looking for a job. Our solution is to train mothers and grandmothers. She might not know how to read and write. She might not ever have left her village. But in six months, we can make them into solar engineers and they can come back and solar electrify their own village. No problem. No problem. No problem. Giving women equal opportunities and equal rights is going to change uh, the world. And those basic values which are enshrined in the conventions formed in this House and in the United Nations over 200 years, uh, the basic principles of gender equality, equal rights to men and women, are so fundamental that we should stand firm on it. And it's key to me. It's actually. I insisted that they should misspell my name today because uh, <laughs> to show that uh, <laughs> to show my dedication to this course. <laughs> but but I think you know standing firm on that is think it's the most natural thing. It's not a Western value. It's not a you know it's an human. international human right. More often than not, um, most African men would tend to want to educate the boys, and the reason for it is very simple: the boys retain the family name. 
the girls, when they get married, the family name changes. They are having to make a choice. They're having to make a choice between educating one child or the other, including if they don't have different um, gender children, they would have to make the same decision between an older child and a younger child. I had to leave university in order to support my young brother, in order for him to be able to complete his secondary school, because I felt it was my responsibility to do so. Why? Because my father died when I was eight years old, and our mother brought us up, and he, she had seven children. So she had to make a choice which child to support. And obviously, it's the one that probably has the best, best chance of bringing additional incomes to the family that would have to be educated. The reality is that it is much more complex and difficult to achieve um, that sort of a right when, in fact, uh, you, you're faced with countries who don't have the, the baseline with which they feel they can make those choices. When I was looking at this and thinking, what would I list as some of the greatest um, challenges we have? Why poverty? I mean, certainly governments delivering on their responsibilities is a major one, um, and they will have to eventually do that, or um, as many are now, facing the consequences of not doing that, and, and conflict is one of them. Uh, religion and culture, I think, are used. I think, ultimately, it is poverty. It is a lack of investment in what are people's rights. Um, to, to a life of dignity. This is basically it. The resources are there. Um, even if we, we, we talk about many countries that have the potentials, they have the resources to exercise those potentials. But often what you're finding is that we use politics, we use religion, we use culture um, as, as, uh, to, to, to fuel what eventually ends up as, 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 uh, as, as conflict. Um, a lot of it is easy to do um, when you've got nothing to live for. As a country, as a nation, God has blessed us with such an abundant natural resource. Now, the paradox is that Zambia is ranked among the bottom 20 poorest countries in terms of poverty. We are wealthy, yet we are poor. The mines was the last great resource that the state held. Zambia made a decision that the country was in such a desperate situation with its very high debt for the mines to be privatized. The bank's assumption was that if you can attract foreign investment, eventually the benefits will trickle down. The mining company was like a mother. Parting with that asset was like cutting the breast from a mother. It's the biggest tax fraud in the history of the United States. And I think I've probably spelled it out, J-A-I-L, jail. Your company is a major investor in the developing world. We believe developing countries need more investment, not less. Robert, without you or I ending up in the High Court being sued by a vast multinational, can you explain to me how Zambia got itself into such a mess in relation to mining? The challenge is this. Do you have a resource at hand? Yes, we have. Do you have the resources to exploit that resource? No, we don't have. It's a chicken and egg situation. I'm old enough to have lived through the process of when the mines were in private hands to the time in 1969 when the then president decided to nationalize the mines. By the time we got to 2000, we were privatizing the mines again. And I can well recall the World Bank instructing us that there would be no more assistance to Zambia unless we privatize the mines. 84% of my people live in poverty. But the statistics at the World Bank, at the IMF, and everywhere else shows that Zambia is a middle-income country. That is not true. And the reason for it is this. The accounting for it is not reflective of the wealth that gets retained within the country. Was it not Mahatma Gandhi who said there is enough for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed? Right now, not a single one of the mining companies pay income tax because 
you will be advised by the external advisors that unless you are willing to give concessions of non-tax, you will not be able to get the investor. Is it not also true that the scramble for Africa was over the resources? There was no Africa with 54 countries before. We did not have boundaries. And Africa's case, and certainly Zambia's case, is a good example of greed. A lot of that has just got to do with straightforward governance and accountability from the lowest levels of government all the way up and the complicity of multinationals um, and, and being allowed to get away with it. it. It's not that we don't have the laws, it's not that we don't have the checks and balances, but enforcing them becomes an issue. And, and, and I think greed does play a great part in this, that right, it is not right that we allow the exploitation. I think that um, strengthening our democratic institutions is going to help. Um, I believe strengthening the voice um, of uh, civil society who's, uh, who have made changes in what has happened um, in our country to try to right the wrongs is, is uh, definitely um, what has, uh, has helped a little. The first 30 years after the early 70s, you know, those countries with the most resources got poorer uh, than those who had no resources because the resource curse was there. Should we have any faith that anything will change. I believe transparency is a absolutely critical part of it. I'm a transparency freak uh, and fanatic. And being able to see this clearly, every single transfer from a company to a government, that can allow the civil society actors and all those who can keep governments accountable uh, to move in and ensure exactly uh, that. Empowerment of negotiators and governments is the other thing. We want to see the World Bank and the IMF to move on your side of the table, and I think they are on your side of the table today. Ten years ago, you didn't have the Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, uh, and they are making a difference all over the world. Also, if you look at African countries now, those who find now oil and minerals and gold and all of it, they actually, it does translate into growth rates. Some of them may not reach the people, and that's a responsibility of African governments. Some of them may not reach the people. That's the understatement of the century, I have to put it here. Sometimes it's easy to demonize these countries uh, and talk about transparency when you don't even see it in Western countries, the transparency that created the global crisis. Where is the transparency about that? You're asking the question, why should we have faith that this will change? Because governments change, because world thinking changes, because personalities change, and things like what you've just shown to us here in the video raise a different level of consciousness in terms of fairness of what we're going to do. Because without any faith, what is our option? Change will come. That you can rest assured. Change will come. Hungry and angry. Another food riot breaks out in the streets in Algeria. The world food crisis is growing. For the millions of people around the world struggling to buy the most basic of foodstuffs, these are desperate times. Rich countries are racing to buy and lease agricultural land abroad and secure their food supplies for the future. Africa, known for its fertile land and low-priced agricultural real estate, has become the target of wealthy investors. The question is, who owns Africa? Who owns the land? Is it the ordinary farmers or is it their governments? Peasants don't own their land. They date from a time before there was land ownership. So they're vulnerable to any force of the state or a company that can come in and literally pull the resources out from under their feet. Any scheme for development that doesn't ask the subjects of development what they want, how they want to live, is not development. Danny, I'm tempted to think I know what you feel about big multinationals coming into Africa and taking over the land, but you might surprise me. Yes, it makes me upset and angry and saw the possibilities of what could happen in Africa, see those now uh, certainly diminish and eviscerated. And, and certainly when we talk about the real issues, when we talk about these issues of development rights and all, all the things that we talk about poverty, we cannot exclude what has happened to those countries within this period of time 
post-independence. You do see land grabbing in Africa and, and land grabbing that is definitely not to the benefit of the people uh, or the country uh, or world food production uh, or combating hunger or poverty or anything else. Because it's grabbing done in a situation where the land rights are badly defined. Land is a big issue. Um, our own nationality is always connected to the land. If you don't have any portion of this earth that you can say, that is my place, which is nobody can take me away from there, then your nationality is very shaky. And this is why in the, the Western countries and, and other places where you've got title deeds, our people never had title deeds. I don't have title deed to the land that belongs to my father. I know that it's from there to there, from there to that until, and to that until, and to that tree, and to that river. That's how we define that. And that's why they are cheated. Uh, and then uh, if it's used to produce uh, food stuff that is not, uh, uh, or that's perhaps used even for bioethanol, it's not going to be beneficial. Um, we need the education, absolutely. Um, most of the time, some of the challenges to, uh, to all of this is, is that lack of knowledge. It's only when you come to want to grow um, your, your opportunities, your land, invest in it, and then you suddenly find you need credit and going to get credit, you need a land. Uh, as we strengthen our institutions, um, that will become probably a better part of what, uh, where people will get their rights. But right now, this is uh, an uphill struggle. I will just leave you with, appropriately enough, a quote from a Danish philosopher, Soren Kierkegaard, who said that the bottom of enmity between strangers lies in difference. And if we have taken anything from tonight, it is that indifference to the plight of our fellow human beings simply isn't an option. Coming here has been such a privilege because I hope that what we can do is to create something globally that will act out locally to scale.